Um, I'd like to ask a question that you will put in the chat, if you please. Um, huh. What's your favorite baseball team named after a bird? You got about 45 seconds to type this in. Nice, mm -hmm. Orioles. Oh, wow. Tons of there, Orioles. there we go. Okay, go. good. Yeah, yes. I'm from I'm from outside DC. Uh, we we honor <laughs> our friends from St. Louis, the Eagles. Well, you know, football, but <laughs> it's still a major team. And then, of course, my mother was from Toledo, so the minor league team there was the is the Toledo Mud Hens. So Ooh. I don't watch baseball. There you go. Uh, anybody else? So we got Cardinals. We've got mm. Orioles. Ah, Blue Jays. Toronto yes. Blue Jays. <laughs> There we go. Those are the three major league baseball birds. Bravo, everyone. <laughs> Bravo. Wonderful. Thank you for typing in the chat your answers. So let's get started on today's program. Next slide. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lori. I'm the children's librarian here at the Felipe de Neve branch of Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm Shirley, the children's librarian at the Lincoln Heights branch. Welcome to our NASI Tuesday's program series, backed by popular demand. We'd like to take time to thank our Library Foundation and our very special behind the scenes staff for helping us bring all of these virtual programs together for you. Next slide. Please note that this program will be recorded. By entering, you are consenting to your likeness possibly appearing in the promotional materials for the Los Angeles Public Library. Now, if you do not wish to have your likeness appear in the recording, please keep your video or your sound off. During the presentation, the video and sound will be disabled, but we will enable both features during the Q&A session at the end. Both the Felipe Denev and Lincoln Heights branch are neighborhood science branches, which means that we have neighborhood science kits for our patrons to check out and take home. If today's program inspires you to become a more active science partner, please come by. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Next slide. Now, on to Nay Sai Tuesdays. Nay Sai, in case you wondered, is short for Neighborhood Science. Neighborhood Science has many names. It is most commonly known as Citizen Science, but it may also be called Community Science, Crowdsource, crowdsource science, contributory science, or even street science. It's basically research that is conducted by non-scientists, non-professionals, ordinary folks like you and me. You don't need to be an A student in math or science. You don't need to have a science background or degree. You just need to have curiosity about the world around you. NASI Tuesdays is a weekly series about learning and contributing to science and sustainable practices in and for your neighborhood. Next slide, please. This year's NASI Tuesdays program series runs from March 22nd to April 26th. If you enjoy our program today, don't forget to check out and register for upcoming program topics at the link that you see on the screen right there. And to register, you can simply scan the QR code or go to bit.ly slash nay sci twos, as you can see on the screen. Next slide. Now, today's program is about LA birders. We will be learning from three Los Angeles birder students about LA's amazing biodiversity. We will learn about what biodiversity means and why it matters. Our presenters will discuss sustainability efforts such as protecting and enhancing our local environments and adapting sustainable practices. Of course, as birders, there will be lots of special focus on birds in the Los Angeles area. We will get to know a few local birds and where to find them and ways we can help them. Next slide, please. Now let's introduce today's amazing presenters. Bella Liu is a 16 year old bird nerd who learned about bird watching through her Science Olympiad coach. She enjoys volunteering in the San Joaquin Tree Swallow Nest Box program and writing tests for Science Olympiad competitions. In her free time, you might find her doodling plants, singing musical theater songs, or talking to her chickens. <laughs> 
Morgan Gaskell is a 16-year-old who has been interested in zoology, environmental con uh, conservation, and the great outdoors for as long as she can remember. She is a bird bander at Zuma Canyon and an avid reader of anything science and birds. Learn more on her website, dedicatedzoologist.com, which features a zoology and conservation newsletter, blog, photos, videos, and a whole lot of birds. Lily Ieskas is a high school senior, senior from Pasadena, California, who has a deep appreciation and interest in birds, marine life, and all things in between. She's an artist, certified scuba diver, advocate for protecting our planet and its inhabitants, and has volunteered at the Aquarium of the Pacific for nearly 10 years. She also happens to love birding in metropolitan parks and gardens, including downtown LA. Lily is autistic and feels grateful for the strengths her brain wiring gives her and cares about being a positive example, encouraging others to presume competence and intelligence in people affected by autism. Now, Morgan, Lily, and Bella, the program is all yours. Take it away. Thank you. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming to this webinar on Los Angeles biodiversity. We're really happy you could join us and we're very excited to share with you some of Los Angeles's rich diversity in wildlife. This will include some common bird species, threats that LA biodiversity faces, and ways that you can help protect the wildlife we share the space with. We are student members from Los Angeles Birders, a nonprofit public benefit all volunteer organization. Los Angeles Birders Students is a subgroup of Los Angeles Birders and is composed of school age students who aspire to be ornithologists and conservationists. And we're currently community scientists, photographers, and artists, bird banders, and volunteers. We're advocates for the environment and we're advocates for birds. So please enjoy our presentation. Take it away, Lily. Well, thank you, Morgan. So today we hope to get you wondering about biodiversity, what it means and why understanding it is important. We're passionate about birds and want to share that with you by showing you ways to protect them and their environment, which is also your environment. Maybe you will be inspired and come up with your own creative ideas for helping wildlife too. Think about the word biodiversity. Bio means life and diversity means variety. Variety of life includes all living things. That means you, me, your dog or cat, the, the lizards in your backyard or insects on your window screen. It also includes the trees on your street, the song that you hear in the morning, and even the weeds popping up through the sidewalk. The variety is enormous. Can you picture a forest? Maybe even the one you see here. It hosts trees, plants, animals, insects, fungi, bacteria, and so much more. Now, think about any other area you can picture and what you might find there. Scientists have estimated that there are about 8.7 million species of plants and animals existing right now, but only around 1.2 million, most of most which are insects, have been have even been identified. That means that millions are still undiscovered. Remember to consider your own neighborhoods. Biodiversity isn't limited to the mountains, jungle, or oceans. It really does exist everywhere. Yes everywhere, throughout the entire planet. If you care about our planet, you care about biodiversity. Biodiversity is the foundation for all healthy ecosystems. An ecosystem is an area where plants, animals, and other organization, organisms, as well as weather and land, work together to create and sustain life. Earth is the home of so many partnering ecosystems. One ecosystem affects another, and so on. Earth's ecosystems give us so much, including water to drink and food to eat. People depend upon balanced ecosystems so we can grow and raise food, make clothing and medicine, and have a lot of things we use every day. Healthy ecosystems also maintain balance in our weather. They give us clean air too. 
Trees and plants don't just look beautiful and give us shade. They release oxygen and absorb carbon dioxide, also known as CO2. CO2 is a greenhouse gas that our planets need, but in limited amounts. Trees and plants clean our air and give us oxygen to breathe. Healthy biodiversity supports human health. When trees and plants are native to an area, it means they originated in a specific region or location. We call it native vegetation. When an area has the vegetation that is intended and it needs, it can do its job well. It gives wildlife and humans what we need and we do well too. It's our responsibility to take care of Earth's ecosystems right back. Wildlife does it automatically. Don't you think we should too? Take a moment to think about the way ecosystems work together by picturing an orchestra. When they're healthy and functioning well, you will hear a lovely symphony. When they're harmed or negatively impacted, they become out of balance. That may sound like a song played out of tune or off tempo, or worse, like different songs played at once. If the ecosystems continue to be mistreated, all of them suffer. The music will become noise. So get this, our hometown of Los Angeles is a biodiversity hotspot, and that's a good thing, but also not such a good thing. In the world of biodiversity science, hotspot is defined as a region that has lost at least 70% of its original natural vegetation, usually caused by human activity. Remember what I said about Earth's ecosystems taking care of us and our responsibility to take care of it right back? Our planet needs us and we each have the power to do something about it. One place you can start is with birds. A humongous variety of birds are found throughout the entire world and they are so important to Earth's ecosystems. Stay tuned to learn more about helping them. Until then, Bella will help you recognize some challenges they face. Take it away, Bella. Thanks, Lily. Uh, LA is facing many habitat loss problems, which is our currently biggest threat to biodiversity. Uh, the issue is animals and plants don't have enough spaces to live because of the way we're managing our land and the way we interact with our ecosystems. Uh, one of the ways that we're reducing habitat for wildlife is river channelization. River channelization is when one area of a river tends to flood a lot. So then the city will come in and put concrete underneath that part of the river. And the good thing is in the short run, this stops the river from flooding over its banks and possibly damaging streets or houses. But in the long run, this is very harmful because when the river is lined with concrete, animals and plants can't live there and the biodiversity that used to be in the river is now lost. Uh, another problem is downstream of the part of the river with concrete, that part of the river floods even more because now the water is flowing really quickly past the part that has concrete. So if we remove the concrete, birds and wild plants can live there again and the channelized part of the river can host biodiversity once more. Uh, but it won't be as good as it was before we put the concrete down. There are different ways to reduce flooding and save people's lives that don't take away places for birds and people to live. Uh, here in the photo, I have a shot of the LA River. It used to be full of wildlife and full of biodiversity, but now that that section is covered in concrete, uh, birds and plants can't live there anymore. Uh, next slide, please. Another habitat loss issue we're facing is habitat fragmentation. This is when humans build a road or neighborhood and it divides a big habitat into smaller pieces. Uh, if you'll look at the photo, you'll notice there's a road that's cutting through the forest. And notice the road itself doesn't take up much area. We're not cutting down that many trees for the road. But now the problem is animals on one side of the forest can't get to the other side. Uh, animals need a certain amount of space to get food, water, to find other animals to make babies with. 
And when we trap them into a smaller chunk, uh, that restricts their ability to survive. And you might think, well, birds can just fly over the road, right? So habitat fragmentation isn't an issue for them. Uh, the problem here is birds rely on animals that can't just fly over. For example, in this forest, there might be squirrels that used to roam throughout the whole forest looking for acorns to eat. But now that there's a road cutting it down the middle, the squirrels can't find enough food. And now the hawks can't find enough squirrels to eat. So the birds still suffer even if they can fly over. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, wildlife corridors are one of the solutions to habitat fragmentation. They're kind of like crossing guards for wild animals. So here in this photo, uh, LA is actually set to build the world's biggest uh, wildlife corridor right now. So you can notice that there's a, kind of a bridge connecting one half of the habitat to the other. And animals can just run over this bridge without worrying about getting hit by a car. Uh, and the reason we need wildlife corridors is people need places to live, they need houses, they need roads. We can't just not build these things because it hurts the environment. So we're coming up with ways that we can still build roads, but it doesn't harm the environment as much. Uh, next slide, please. Birds provide a lot of ecosystem services. When we think of birds, we kind of think of them as separate from our own lives. They're just kind of pretty things we look at but they help us directly in a lot of different ways. Uh, one of those ways is seed dispersal. When birds eat fruit and then they fly somewhere else and poop out the seeds in a different place. And this helps plants spread to new places. Uh, another thing they do is pollination. For example, birds will drink the nectar of flowers. And then when they drink the nectar from one flower, a little bit of pollen gets on the bird's forehead. And then they'll drink the flower of a different plant and the original pollen gets transferred to the new plant. And this helps trees and plants reproduce and make more plants. Uh, a big reason this is helpful for us is our crops, like the vegetables and fruit that we eat. Uh, those all require pollination for them to develop. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another important ecosystem service of birds is they eat insects and rodents. Uh, I don't know about you, but I do not like having bugs and rats in my house and birds help with that. For example, in my photo, I have the black Phoebe, which is a bird that shows up in backyards a lot. And what they do is they fly around your backyard, catching insects and eating them. And those birds, and sorry, those insects might otherwise bite or sting people. Uh, hawks will also fly through people's backyards and catch rats and squirrels to help manage our pest issues. Uh, something that goes underappreciated is scavengers. Scavengers are animals that eat dead animals. And at first it sounds really gross, but it's really helpful for us because when, a dead, when an animal dies, uh, it might be sick and it might get other animals sick. But say a raven or a vulture might come along and eat that dead animal. And that raven or vulture is stopping sickness from spreading. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, birds are an indicator species or a kind of a warning sign. Uh, they show that we're harming the environment before we do too much damage. So when we know birds disappear, we need to act. Uh, here I have a quote from Roger Torrey Peterson, who's a very well-known ornithologist or bird scientist. He said that birds are indicators of the environment. If they are in trouble, we know we'll soon be in trouble. Uh, next slide, please. So there are a lot of birds in the world. Uh, total, there are about 10,000 species. And just in North America, we have 2,000. Uh, in California, there are 600 of those. And Los Angeles, we have over 500. Uh, so Lily mentioned before that Los Angeles is a biodiversity hotspot. And I think putting the numbers on a screen really lets it sink in that how many different types of birds are here uh, Los Angeles County is the birdiest county in the United States. We have so many different kinds of birds because we have so many different types of habitat. For example, some birds can only live by the ocean and some birds can only live in the mountains. 
But since our county has both of those habitats, we can have ocean birds and mountain birds. Uh, that's part of why it's so important to protect Los Angeles habitat because we hold so many different types of birds here. Next slide, please. Uh, here are some of the more common birds you might come across in LA. So on my screen, I have the mallard and the Canada goose. Often if you go to the park and, well, there's some birds floating on the lake, uh, usually the ducks are called mallards and the Canada geese, which have longer necks, are, well, they're Canada geese. Uh, a lot of people feed bread to the ducks and geese because they don't know better. This is actually really harmful to the ducks and geese. Uh, it's like feeding them junk food because they're getting a lot of calories, but they're not getting the nutrients they need to grow. Peas and grapes are better because at least they're getting the vitamins they need to grow in addition to the calories. But it's best to not feed birds because when you feed a bird, you teach the bird that, oh, they can come up to humans and the humans will give them food. Uh, some people will take advantage of this to harm the birds instead. So even though it's tempting, it's best to not feed the birds. Uh, mallards exhibit sexual dimorphism, which is when the male looks different from the female. Uh, male mallards have a shiny green head uh, and it's very pretty and you can see it from a distance. Uh, the purpose of this is attracting females so they can make baby ducks together. Uh, females like the one I have on the left side of the slide, uh, they're brown to blend in with their environment. And they kind of look boring at first, but if you think about it, this is a really cool adaptation because it lets them hide from the predators. Like in that photo, it's hard to tell there's a bird there because it blends in with its background. Uh, so say a hawk that might want to eat the duck also can't see the duck. Uh, Canada geese are migratory, meaning in the winter they head south to live somewhere warmer and they come back in the spring. Uh, if you look overhead, you'll often see geese flying in a V formation. And this is because when a bird is flying, there's a patch of air behind it that makes it easier to fly in. So flying in a V formation saves energy for all the birds in there. Uh, Canada geese also eat grass, which seems very mundane and boring, but this is special because very few birds eat grass or leaves and turn that into energy. Uh, different parts of a plant have different amounts of energy. The seeds and fruit have the most energy, so that's what most birds eat. Uh, but Canada geese can ex extract the energy from low calorie grass and turn that into the energy they need to fly so far. Next slide, please. Uh, here are two birds that might show up in your backyard more often. So on the left side, I have a California tohi. And when we think of birds, we think about a bird sitting in a tree, right? But tohis are a type of sparrow and sparrows like to uh, peck for food on the ground. So if you wanna see a California tohi, you're better off looking underneath the tree or on the lawn instead of in the tree branches. California tohis often see the reflection in a window and they don't realize it's a reflection of themselves. They think it's a second bird. So in their mind, they now have to fight off that second bird to protect their territory. Um, so in the spring, if someone asks you, hey, there's this brown bird and it, it's just pecking my window over and over, it might be a California tohi. Uh, Western bluebirds are another backyard bird. Their feathers are only blue from the right angle. So sometimes if you look at a Western bluebird, it'll look great, but then it'll move and it'll look blue again. Uh, they build nests in tree holes that woodpeckers make because they can't dig their own holes. So a woodpecker might uh, cut out a hole within a tree and then the woodpecker raises its babies in the hole. Then once the woodpeckers leave, the bluebirds move in. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, all right, I'm gonna hand the slides over to Lily. Take it away. Why, right, thanks, Bella. So let's talk about differences are common around urban and suburban neighborhoods, parks and green spaces, as well as woodlands and chaparral. Males have black caps and are brighter than females. They love eating small seeds like thistle, so they are often attracted to plants with small seeds and bird feeders that hold nitro or thistle. Morning doves are very common and abundant in the same areas. They are often seen in trees and on electrical wires or walking on the ground. During spring and summer, they give off mournful cooing 
calls that sound like ooh, 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 ooh. The calls may sound a bit like those of owls, but they're the distinct calls of morning doves. Black phoebes are widespread in many habitats, including urban parks and green spaces, neighborhoods, and chaparral. They are often found around bodies of water like ponds, lakes, and streams. They are flycatchers, so they eat insects. Usually they are seen flycatching by flying and swooping around, catching insects in the air. House finches are very commonly seen throughout LA. Males can be identified by their red heads, which females lack. I'm gonna be passing it over to Morgan. Take it away, Morgan. Thanks so much, Shelley. Okay, so here I have two pictures of a California scrub jay on the left and a northern mockingbird on the right. Both I took in my own neighborhood, so look out for them in yours. Um, California scrub jays are commonly found in oak woodlands and chaparral habitats. You can frequently find them eating or hiding acorns, so it's not uncommon for a forgotten acorn to grow into an oak tree. This way, scrub jays are helping to plant native oak trees across LA. You can frequently hear scrub jays vocalizing. In fact, there are some 20 different calls known. The most common sounds are mostly harsh squawks. So have you ever heard a bird singing late into the night and you're certain it wasn't an owl? Well, perhaps it was the northern mockingbird. Mockingbirds are fantastic singers. They're even able to imitate the calls of other birds, frogs, toads, and even human-made noises. In fact, people liked the northern mockingbird song so much that the illegal pet trade depleted their population significantly in the 19th century. Birds were sold for up to $1,300 in today's money. Luckily, northern mockingbird populations have been able to rebound since, and they're now very common in urban settings where you can commonly find them in places such as parks and backyards. Northern mockingbirds are also extremely territorial. When they feel threatened, either by a predator or when a person gets too close to their nest, they'll swoop down and dive bomb the attacker. The white patches on their wings and tail act as a warning sign, telling predators to stay away. These patches are also useful in mating rituals and territorial defense between other northern mockingbirds. Next slide, please. Okay, so I also have the acorn woodpecker and the red-tailed hawk. So acorn woodpeckers are perhaps one of the most charismatic birds of LA. Their appearance, calls, and behaviors are unmistakable. Unlike most woodpecker species, acorn woodpeckers live in a complex social structure. Groups can contain as many as 10 to 16 individuals. Each bird helps out the other by cleaning them, protecting nests, and contributing to acorn granaries. Acorn granaries are essentially areas of a tree trunk that woodpeckers have converted into a refrigerator. They are used by multiple generations and can therefore contain hundreds of acorns. Woodpeckers will often use dead or dying trees to store their acorns because the wood is softer. The trees will also often have insect larvae living inside too, which makes for a quick snack for the woodpeckers. Acorn woodpeckers, like other woodpecker species, have special feet with two toes in the front and two toes in the back. These zygodactyl feet, as they're called, allow the bird to grip the tree while moving in both vertical and horizontal movements. So have you ever looked up in the sky and seen a large bird with a red tail and wing feathers with black edging? Well, you might have seen a red-tailed hawk. Red-tailed hawks have a wingspan of about four feet, or the average height of a seven-year-old. As with many raptor species, the female is larger than the males. Red-tails are the second largest hawk species in North America, the first being the ferruginous hawk, which is known to occur in LA during the winter, but is much less common than other raptors. Red tails are also super hunters. They mostly feed on rodents such as mice, voles, and small mammals, keeping these populations in check. They'll also feed on snakes and occasionally small birds. The talons can be up to one and a third inches long. Uh, next slide, please. So these are just a few more examples of the bird life residing in Los Angeles. Some are commonly seen such as song sparrows and pipe oak grebes, while others are a bit more uncommon like lesser scops and Ross's geese. Nonetheless, they all contribute to the rich biodiversity that LA has to offer. Next slide, please. So all this talk about the issues that LA biodiversity faces and the bounty of birds living here, but what is the county doing to protect the incredible wildlife and landscape? Next slide, please. So scientific research allows us to collect data across a wide variety of disciplines. When it comes to birds, a process called bird banding allows us to gather invaluable data on wild bird populations. Bird banders attain permits that allow them to catch birds in nets and tag them with a unique number. Bird banding can lead to a greater understanding of birds, including their migration, their molt, breeding, and a lot more. Banding also helps us focus quality conservation measures where birds need it most. Next slide, please. 
So bird banding is a process of setting up nets ranging from 32 to 40 feet in length with, about, with a mesh of about an inch. This kind of net, called a mist net, is used to capture birds because they're hard for birds to see as they fly into them. It's completely harmless. But once a bird is caught, bird banders will extract the bird from the net, put them in bags, and take them to their banding station. Once at the banding station, the banders begin to take measurements and collect data on the bird. This might include conditions of the feathers, the length of the wing, whether the bird is regrowing or growing in new feathers. Banders also collect data on the bird's weight and level of fat and muscle. This leads to questions like, is there enough food in a bird's habitat so that they can store enough muscle and fat? And because banding station also though get migratory species as well. This leads to questions like, are these birds getting enough food to store enough fat for muscle and muscle for their trip? And were they able to get enough food along the way? Are migratory birds in good enough conditions after their trips? Banders also collect data on the bird's breeding status. If the conditions of a bird's habitat or population are poor, then they won't breed. This will affect the population as a whole. This allows researchers to analyze the impacts of say, a drought or a recent fire on bird populations. Bird banding provides invaluable data on the lives of birds. The health of these bird populations help inform scientific and conservation related efforts. For instance, when migratory birds aren't doing well in one part of their range, how will that affect their populations by the time they reach the destination? This takes bird conservation to a transnational level with migrating birds from South America to North America and vice versa, for example. If bird populations are truly to thrive, then they have to be protected throughout their whole migration route. Next slide, please. So I'm a bird bander at Zuma Canyon and banding goes a little something like this. The team and I set up around 20 nets in total at sunrise. And for me recently, that means waking up at around 5 a.m. I call it dedication. My parents who have to drive me there call it crazy. Then 45 minute, every 45 minutes after setting up the nets, we go and check them. If there are birds, we untangle them and put them in bags. After checking all the nets we're in charge of, we take the birds back to the banding station to collect data. We place a metal band with a unique number on the bird's leg. If the bird is ever caught again, we'll be able to add on to the data that was collected the first time. This way, we can expand on what we know for individual birds as opposed to just the population as a whole. We record a variety of data points in our notebooks. When put all together, we can determine the overall health of a species at Zuma. Next slide, please. So there are a total of four banding stations located in LA County, and these, includes the one, these include the ones at Zuma Canyon and Bear Divide. Zuma Canyon is located in the Santa Monica Mountains in Malibu, and the station is in its 28th year. The station has provided wonderful data on bird response to fire after the area burned in late 2018, as well as the effects of the ongoing drought on bird populations. The station has submitted data on just over 24,000 birds from 107 species as of the end of 2021. This photo to the right is of a dusky flycatcher that was caught at Zuma three times within three months. This bird was technically supposed to be in Mexico at the time, but they decided to stop by California. Because they were caught so many times, we were able to track the bird's molt and fat and muscle content. So the area located in the San Gabriel Mountains known as Bear Divide was largely undervalued for its bird activity until a team from Occidental College in LA learned of the incredible numbers of birds that passed through during the migration. The Bear Divide banding station is only operative during the spring months when it, when it documents birds on their spring migration. The station cataloged just under 2,000 birds in about six weeks during the spring last year. When spring migration is in full swing, the station will be up and running for its second year. You can visit Bear Divide during spring migration from the months of March through June. See what birds you see flying and how many. Hint, it's in the hundreds. Bird banding at Bear Divide started this morning, actually, and will go through May 14th. I really encourage you to talk to one of the bird banders if they're available, if you so choose to visit. Next slide, please. So we catch a wide variety of birds at Zuma Canyon, some of which include the only resident warbler species, the common yellow throat. We also catch bush tits, Allen's and Anna's hummingbirds, and the occasional acorn woodpecker, if we're lucky. We also catch many migratory birds, which right now includes birds such as Audubon's warblers, white crowned sparrows, and soon a bunch of birds coming in for their spring migration. Next slide, please. Okay, so community science is, at its simplest, a way for everyday people in the world to submit observations on what they see. This data goes on to inform scientists and conservationists about species diversity, population influx, such as migration, and a species overall health. Community science is a great way to learn about your local species and gain a deeper appreciation for nature. The best part is, you don't have to be a trained scientist to contribute data on the world around you. Okay. So one such community science platform is iNaturalist. iNaturalist is available as both a website and a free app. 
The platform utilizes artificial intelligence to identify plant, animal, and even protozoan species, which is pretty cool. A naturalist also relies on people in the community to help out with species identification. This way, you can improve your ID skills and help out others as well. So far, people have observed a little less than 12,000 species in Los Angeles alone, 526 of which are birds. Next slide, please. When it comes to bird-specific community science, eBird is the place to be. The platform created by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is available as both a website and a free mobile app. At its simplest, eBird is a way for people to go out and document the birds they see and hear in the form of a checklist. eBird also makes it easy to share photos and audio recordings, as well as finding local hotspots to bird. eBird is used by expert and beginner birders alike, and the data helps inform ornithologists and environmental conservationists tracking bird population health. And Los Angeles is an avid eBird user. In fact, LA has the most complete checklists of any US county. A total of 533 bird species have been recorded in LA to date. Next slide, please. Okay, so now you know about what LA County is doing as a whole to protect biodiversity, but how can you as an individual help protect this environment? That might be the species residing in your local park or even your own neighborhood or backyard. Next slide, please. So every year, an estimated 1 billion birds die of window collisions in the US alone. Window strikes most often happen when birds see reflective landscapes, attack the window out of territorial aggression, or when they're attracted to the light inside a house. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Putting screens, netting, or UV reflective stickers on windows helps prevent window strikes and saves bird lives. In the top photo to the right, a group of bird researchers and artists decorate windows considered high risk at a university in Canada with liquid chalk and window decals. A biology professor at the school shared with Global News Thursday that, quote, the group hopes to not only save birds on campus, but to inspire homeowners to decorate their windows as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so have you ever looked out the window or driven through downtown LA and thought, wow, those are some really bright lights. Those same lights are not only responsible for light pollution, but also contribute to the some 365 to 988 million bird deaths in the US every year from building collisions alone. During spring migration in Los Angeles, the skies are filled with thousands of birds flying over above our heads in the dark, navigating using the moon, the moon and each other as their guides. It's rather hard to spot them, but scientists can analyze the thousands of calls that they make to each other to get an idea of how many birds are passing through and what species. But another way is collecting birds that have unfortunately been killed by windows after veering off their migration routes. Bright lights are known to cause birds to get off track during the migration. Birds will cluster around these lights and make no forward progress to their destinations. They can easily tire out and may have to spend an extra day in that area where they are then threatened by cats, windows, and harmful chemicals. Simply turning off a switch can save millions of bird lives every year, as well as conserving energy. We don't necessarily have to turn off every single light, but turning off or dimming non-essential lighting during mass migrations definitely makes an impact. The Lights Out program is a citywide effort to protect nocturnal migrants by turning off all or non-essential lighting. The first city to implement the Lights Out program was Chicago, Illinois in 1999. Since then, over 30 cities in North America have joined them. Unfortunately, Los Angeles is not one of them, but contacting your local elected officials or building managers is a step in the right direction. You can also subscribe to BirdCast's Lights Out Alerts, which tell you the night's migration forecast and if a Lights Out Alert has been issued in the area. Next slide, please. So while structures such as community or communication towers and power lines are a major contributor to bird deaths, the lights given off by residencies and buildings are also extremely concerning. Close to 593 million birds die annually after being attracted to these lights. Songbirds, especially warblers, thrushes, and sparrows are the major victims here as they fly at lower elevations on average than other migratory birds such as ducks and geese. Next slide, please. So unfortunately, even our furry feline friends can quickly become a threat to birds. Since their introduction, feral and domestic outdoor cats have posed a serious threat to birds and other wildlife such as mammals and reptiles. When cats see a bird around, they can't help but unleash their natural instincts. And I know my indoor cats have certainly eyed birds even through the window. Cat predation is the leading cause of bird deaths in the US. The estimated 100 million cats living in the United States have been responsible for the some 2.4 billion bird deaths that are recorded annually in the country as a result of cat predation. It really is best to keep your cats indoors for a variety of reasons. Outdoor cats pose a serious risk to the environment and are responsible for killing not just birds, but also um, mammals and reptiles. 
um, and they disrupt the balance of ecosystems and they spread diseases such as rabies and parasites, such as fleas and Toxoplasma gondii, which causes the disease toxoplasmosis. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Bella. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, another thing you can do to help birds is buy your coffee from the right places. The currently normal way of growing coffee is finding a forest, cutting down all the native trees, uh, planting coffee plants and growing those coffee plants out in the open. And because the trees are cut down, the coffee grows faster. And since they make more coffee, uh, you can buy the coffee cheaper. But this is really harmful to birds because again, it's contributing to that habitat loss where the birds don't have native trees to live in anymore. Uh, one thing you can buy is bird-friendly coffee, which is uh, when coffee is grown in the forest without cutting down any trees. All the native trees are still there. We're just putting some coffee plants underneath them. Uh, this is good for the birds because they still have places to live. And because coffee grows a little bit slower in the shade, bird-friendly coffee can cost more, but it's so much better for the environment. Uh, birds also help out the coffee plantations when it's shade grown. For example, they'll pick off the insects that might eat the tobacco. So we don't have, sorry, not the fact, that might eat the coffee. And this way we don't have to spend as much money on pesticides. Uh, many websites like the Smithsonian National Zoo and Bird and Bean sell bird-friendly coffee, which is a type of coffee that's good for the environment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here the diagram is a good way to show the difference between uh, partial shade grown coffee and bird friendly shade grown coffee. Uh, so the middle and right parts of the diagram look very similar because well the coffee is both being grown under trees right but uh, if you look carefully at the diagram the middle part of the diagram is when the coffee is grown under fruit trees which are not native to the environment. And even though they're trees and the coffee can be sold as shade grown, the birds can't live in it because they're not native trees. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but on the diagram, sun-grown coffee hosts 61 bird species. Partial shade coffee hosts 79 bird species, which is a little better, but it's not that big of a change. And then the bird-friendly shade grown coffee on the right side hosts 243 species. That's more than double uh, either sun-grown coffee or partial shade. So here you can kind of see the importance of having native plants and growing coffee under the native forest, not just any type of tree. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another thing you can do is bring a bit of nature into your backyard. Uh, I know a lot of us think of all plants as kind of the same, but the type of plant you're planting can make it big different for birds. And the best thing you can do for birds in terms of gardening is planting native plants. And those are plants that have been growing in uh, whatever area you live in for a long time, they've adapted to that climate and the birds and wildlife there uh, know what the plant is so they can hide in the plant, they can use that plant for food, which they can't do with all gardening plants. Um, so when you plant native plants, it's not just good for the wildlife, you're also saving money because they're adapted to your environment. For example, in California, we get very little rainfall. So when a lot of people plant plants that are not native, they have to spend a lot of money watering the plant to keep it alive. But since our plants are used to having very little water, we don't have to spend as much money watering the plant uh, if we plant native plants. Uh, some popular choices include California buckwheat, California sagebrush, toyon, black sage, oaks, and hummingbird sage. Uh, if you need some guidance on what types of plants are best for your yard, you can try going to a local plant nursery and asking about native plants. Uh, next slide, please. Another thing you can do is avoiding pesticides and chemicals that can harm birds. Um, when people think of pesticides, they think, oh, well, it kills the bugs that eats my plants. It kills the rats that eats my plants, but it doesn't harm anything else. But that's not true. Uh, something called biomagnification is when you go up the food chain, uh, the concentration of something poisonous 
will increase. So for example, if you put a pesticide on your lawn and now the grass seeds have a little bit of pesticide on it, the grass isn't affected that much because uh, to the grass, this is very little. And then maybe a mouse comes along and it eats a bunch of grass seeds. Uh, so now there's more pesticide in the rat than initially there was in the grass seeds. And then a snake comes along and it eats several rats or mice. And now the snake has even more pesticides in it than before. And then a hawk might come along and eat that snake. So the small amount of pesticide you put on your lawn, uh, by itself, it wouldn't affect the hawk that much. But since by the time that pesticide reaches the snake, it's so concentrated, there's so much pesticide in so little meat, the hawk can get poisoned from the snake and die as a result. Uh, so try to be mindful of what pesticides you're using on your lawn and garden and how much you're using uh, because this can and does kill birds even if we don't immediately see it. Uh, we can look for nature-friendly alternatives such as organic pesticides. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to pass the slides over to Lily, so take it away. Thank you, Bella. So follow your passion and connect with like-minded people by joining an organization that takes action or start your own group. Among friends or at school, feeling empowered starts with you as an individual by creating new habits and sharing with your family and friends about what you've learned. You can make a difference. When we know better, we can do better. You don't need to know a lot about birds to enjoy observing them. Just go outside. Look and listen. You might be surprised with, by the variety that you see and how entertaining and therapeutic watching them can feel. When they're moving about, try to wonder and guess what they're doing. Birding is fun to do independently and along with other birders. There are great places to bird throughout the city and county of Los Angeles. Here's just a few. Maybe Angels Knoll. Unfortunately, Angels Knoll will soon be lost. There are definite plans to build two high-rise buildings over that green space. If we've got you thinking about birding, it's a lot of fun to identify the birds you're, you're seeing. A good field guide is essential for that. This is one of our favorites. It was co-authored by Kimball Garrett and John Dunn, who are experts in the field of ornithology and met when they were young boys interested in birds. It's small and easy to carry with you, and it includes great photos and facts about all the birds of Southern California. National field guides don't typically include all birds specific to one area. So this is a great book to get you started. Take it away, Morgan. Thanks, Lily. So one great resource is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. The Cornell Lab combines cutting edge technology and science to deliver unparalleled information on birds. And this includes Merlin Bird ID, which uses AI trained by eBird data to identify photos and audio recordings of birds. This also includes the Macaulay Library, which merged with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and have since created the ultimate archive of stunning bird photos, videos, and audio recordings. The Cornell Lab Bird Academy offers free online courses, bird games, and videos to help you become a better birder, photographer, and environmental steward. And a couple of them are free. Um, I think it's back to you, Lily. Thanks, Morgan. For some time, birding group field trips were put on hold due to COVID-19. But many, like Los Angeles birders and Los Angeles birders students, are getting started again with safety restrictions in place. Brooding groups are a great way to get involved and meet interested and interesting people. Take it away, Susan. Yeah, and we'd love to have you become a member of Los Angeles Birders um, and Los Angeles Birders students. It's it's easy. Um, you can go to our website at losangelesbirders.org. It's $10 a year for students and uh, adults or $20 a year. We have webinars, usually two a month. The first one is focused on science and birds, and the second one is usually an identification issue, um, some ch something challenging like swallows, perhaps, or sparrows. Um, if you have questions or you're interested in finding out more about what we do, just um, email us at uh, students at labirders.org, and I'll get in touch with you. Thank you, Lily. Uh, so just to recap what we've covered today, 
biodiversity is the variety of life. All ecosystems depend on healthy biodiversity. Uh, habitat loss is when human buildings are taking away places for animals to live. Uh, for example, rivers lined with concrete take away places for river animals to live. Habitat fragmentation divides habitat into smaller pieces and wildlife corridors can serve as a solution for habitat fragmentation. Uh, please write emails and letters to your local lawmakers about these issues. If we don't speak up about them, then our legislators won't know that there's an issue. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the chat. Um, I think it's time to show our citations and photo credits. So uh, here are all the people that have contributed to the presentation. Um, and also, next slide, please. Uh, here are some of the sources we used while building the presentation. Uh, if you want to learn about any of these more in depth, feel free to shoot us an email and we'll try to get back to you. Uh, next slide, please. Here, there are more citations. Uh, next slide, please. And here are all the sources we've pulled photos from to help build visual aids in the presentation. Uh, all right, I think that's the end of our presentation and feel free to ask questions. Oh my goodness. Thank you to Morgan, Lily, and Bella for a beautifully, beautifully done presentation. Informative. Um, so, so well done. So, so thank you. I, I learned about birds and I can't wait to walk my dog tonight so that we can listen for and listen to and look for more birds um, just in our neighborhood. So um, as, as the student said, um, you can place some questions in the Q&A and we can uh, do our best. They, they will do their best to answer them. I'm going to do a plug for the library um, that we've got many, many books in the library on biodiversity and birds. Um, I have a book on biodiversity right here and I happen to have a very big book of birds here at my library. So there are lots and lots of bird books, uh, some of which Shirley and I are going to be highlighting at our at a special bird program in the middle of May. So NASI attendees, stay tuned. So are there any, I any see, questions? Yeah, I see one question. Um... Uh, from Ms. Gloria, as a kindergarten teacher, how might my kindergarten students help to maintain the biodiversity of the birds in our community? Oh, I can take this one. So I think what I wish I'd had as a kindergartner was a community garden where we plant native plants. I think that's a very helpful hands-on activity. And then like as the plants are growing, you can come back and see what wildlife might visit your garden. Um, and I'm not sure if this is age appropriate, but maybe writing letters as a class to legislators about the issues uh, in our community is a good way for them to get involved. Okay. So the information to become a member, yes, that's on the labirders.org website, if I'm correct. Um, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful website. Um, so, um, well, uh, Shirley, do you think it's time to uh, talk about placing those binoculars in someone's hands? Do you think it's time? Yes, yes, a good time. Um, let's see. So can, can we have the, the next slide to the giveaway mm -hmm. part? And we're almost, there we go. Oh. Yes. Okay, before the giveaway, Lori, you're gonna talk about this oh, slide? Uh, yes, I sure am. So uh, let me see where this slide is. I am talking about, um, uh, okay, um, 
let me see where the I naturalist uh, thing is here today. I'm very sorry. Let me see if I, well, um, Vivian, I'm not sure what to say about this I naturalist, except that it is this the QR code to register for the next program? Yes. No, I'm going to jump in for you. Okay. Um, so okay. before we move, no problem. Before we move over to the NASA giveaway, I just want to encourage you all who are in the audience today to download this amazingly fun and useful app called iNaturalist. It had helped me identify so many interesting birds in my own backyard. I didn't know the name of. And all you need to do is to download the app to your phone or a smart device, uh, internet connected, and then register an account with your email address. And then you can start taking pictures or recording the sound of all these cool wildlife around your home, and then just upload them to the iNaturalist app. The artificial intelligence mechanism, as well as millions of naturalists from around the world will help you identify the species you don't know about. And I just wanna share with you, thanks to this app, I can now actually identify the sound made by Northern Mockingbirds. That is so cool for me. So now it's like when it's chirping in my backyard, I can totally tell that's what type of bird it is. So it's really fun. So if you never have that app, used the app before, please go ahead and scan the QR code on screen and just go to, or go to inaturalist.org to check it out. And that's a quick, um, sorry for the, for the intrusion. So I'm gonna hand this back to Shirley. <laughs> or Lori. Well, I think, um, so before we tell everybody about next week's program, it is time to give away those binoculars. <laughs> yes. So we're going to ask one question from the presentation today. Um, after we announce the question, we will count to three. If you know the answer, please use the raise hand button on the menu bar. If you are the first one to raise your hand and answer the question correctly, you'll be rewarded with our prize today, a pair of binoculars. So this is limited to participants in the LA area. Okay, so shall we get started, Lori? Yes, so um, I believe, um, I believe Bella is going to be the one to actually ask the question. So we have to make sure that everybody's arms are ready, everybody's hands are ready to fly up into the air. So um, Bella, um, if you, would ask your question. And then after it's asked, I'll count one, two, three. And then we have several pairs of eyes, like Hawkeyes, <laughs> who are going to be looking at the screen to see who answers first. So um, Bella, are you ready? Yep. All right. Thank All right. You. So I will, I will let you ask the question. All right. Thank you, Laurie. The question is, what kind of plants should you plant in your backyard to best help birds? And Okay, so the best plants to plant in your backyard to help birds. So one, two. Hold on one second. Hold on. Oh, Sorry. Um, nope. <laughs> everyone, please have your hands down right now. Oh, We're yes. Count down. to three. Yes. And I'll then to whoever right. click the button first, you will be the first one to answer. So have your hands down, please, Ingrid, Allison. Okay. All right. All okay, right. We have one more person who's hands up. Let me find out first. Ingrid, you know, your hand needs to be down. <laughs> The excitement builds. Yes. All right. Suspense. Okay. Okay. So, so may I count? Yes. Okay. One, two, <laughs> three. I see Allison. Plants to plant in yeah. your backyard. I see Allison. I don't know who else did you guys see? Oh, um, my one. screen isn't letting me see folks. So, um, <laughs> uh, what about you guys? The audience there. But. I think I saw Allison. Okay, Allison, I'm going to go ahead and mute you and you can go ahead and just um, tell us the answer. Okay, where did she go? She was on the screen. Now she disappeared. What? Okay, there, Allison, she. Okay. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, what is? I think we should. I'll be out as soon as I can. Thank oh. you. Um, I think we have to plant um, the coffee. So uh, uh, that's close, but that's not quite right. Um, I mean, I appreciate you wanting to plant coffee, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> but. Um, okay, we're going to do it one more time. So everybody, please have your hands down. Hands down. Mm -hmm. Hands down. And we're going to okay. count to three. Okay, remember, this is the types of plants you want to plant in your backyard to, to attract birds. Mm -hmm. So we're so going to we, count. 
Sri, yep. please have your hands down. Hands down, feathers down. Okay, furled. furled. Ooh, okay, furled. Sabrina, hands down. Sri, hands down. Okay, I'm gonna lower your hand for you. Okay, all right. I'm gonna we're gonna count to three. Go ahead, Lori. One, two, <laughs> three. I think I saw Bruno right after the countdown ended. Oh, what about everyone else? All right, Bruno, I'm going to mute you. Go ahead and tell us the answer. Um, I think it's fruit trees. <laughs> we're getting closer, but we're not quite there. Uh, we're thinking about not what type of species of plant, but what plant in terms of... More general. <laughs> yeah, more general. Okay, so, coffee, so everyone, please fruit. have your hands down. We're going to try one more time. If no one get it correctly, we're going to announce the answer. <laughs> okay, Marcia, have your hands down. Francisco, hands down. Okay, Marcia, you need to wait till we count to three. Otherwise, we won't call you because you, you're a little sooner than other people. <laughs> okay, all right, count to three. Go ahead. So remember, no, not the, yet, the, not yet, hands not down. Yet. Nope. The kinds of plants to plant to attract more birds, and I'm going to count backwards this time. So in three, may, may I start, Vivian? Yes. yes. In three, two, one, lift off. Sabrina. Go ahead. I think you want to plant native plants. Yes. <laughs> you got it correct. <laughs> Yay, congratulations. <laughs> All right. We'll put the binoculars on little wings and send them over. <laughs> well, actually, Vivian will tell you how to, you know, get them. <laughs> yes, um, Sabrina, I am going to put my email in the chat. Please um, copy down my email and you are going to send me your name and your mailing address and we'll be sending the binoculars to you. Yay. So I believe that ends our giveaway session. <laughs> right. So Shirley. Yes. Thank you for participating in our giveaway. That was so much fun. Our program today is coming to an end. Thank you again, Morgan, Lily, and Bella for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our program and learned a few new things that we all can do to help make our neighborhood a better place and more eco-friendly and sustainable for birds and many wildlife. Our next NASI Tuesday presentation is about the disastrous lead contamination in East Los Angeles caused by a battery recycling facility that made many people sick. We will be hearing from residents in the affected communities about the disaster and how they use science to help them regain their voices back again. This program is suitable for ages 12 and up. If you have not yet registered for this event, please be sure to do so. Again, we're going to put the QR, um, the registration QR code and the bit.ly uh, link on the screen. And, and there it is. So uh, the next, ah, we have one, one, more, one more thing that we'd like to have you do before you leave. Yes, so before you leave, we have one more question for you. Please tell us one thing you learned or discovered from today's program. And you can just type it in the chat. So we'd love to hear what you learned from today's program. I learned, my goodness, I took a whole page of notes that I just, um, from our resident scientists, ornithologists. How to save the environment. Well, there were some questions. Uh, which plants attract birds? Oh, I, 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 the coffee production and birds was new for me as well. Yes, so me I too. appreciate learning about that. Uh, Alette, sorry if I mispronounced your name. I saw your question in the question and answer box. The question was, what if you see a hurt bird? Um, so the best thing to do is watch it for maybe 10, 15 minutes and see if it flies away on its own. Uh, this is because sometimes birds will just be in shock for a while and they'll be fine afterward. If after 10, 15 minutes, the bird still hasn't moved, you can try putting it in a dark box in a quiet place. Don't touch it, don't uh, disturb it, and don't give it food or water because it can choke. 
and then try to find a local wildlife re rehabilitator because those people are qualified to help the bird. They know what to do. Uh, thanks Very for asking. Question. That. Very good question. And Bella, it looks like we have a few more questions in there. If you guys want to go ahead and address those, totally, that's totally fine too. Billy looks excited. <laughs> uh, we have someone ask what birds are, what birds are, which birds are your favorites? Mm. And Lily, you can go ahead and answer that if you want. It's very hard because I love so many birds, but I of course love urban birds like Northern Mockingbird, Townsend Warblers, and many others. I went bird watching in Honduras once and saw a beautiful turquoise bird moth, moth, which I've fallen in love with. Though I love many other birds too, so it's really hard to decide. Those are some fun of the few I really like the most, however. Thank you. Okay, we have one more question from Danny Lopez. How to pick a pair of binoculars for birders who are new to bird watching? Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. And feel free to jump in, Susan, if you think that's more of a question for you. Yeah, or, I can yeah, answer maybe. that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you really want to have a, a binocular that's a good size for you, something that feels comfortable in your hands, but you want to be able to have enough magnification and enough width in the binocular tubes that you're looking through that it's not just narrow um, focus. So, you know, I started out and I had like opera binoculars. Well, I can't <laughs> see a thing with those. So I'm going to ask you to write down some numbers um, eight by 42s are awfully nice binocular. Eight by 32 will get you there. Um, I wouldn't go 10 by 42, 10 by 32. Those are fine. I wouldn't go over 10. That's the magnification because they're so heavy and they're so big. Um, I find um, you don't have to spend a fortune on your first pair of binoculars. Um, you can find something on Amazon for less than $100. Um, Celestron makes one, I think it's called Nature DX. Um, I'm not, I don't, I'm not part of them. I'm not making any money from Celestron, but that's what I recommend for the students who get started. And it's a good binocular, nice clear glass, and it'll get you started. And then if you really fall in love with it, you can, yeah, but Lily's showing the box there. Yep, yeah, thanks, Lily. Oh. And uh, those are a good way to get started. And then someday you might want to, you know, get another pair of binoculars and then, but they can cost thousands of dollars. And so don't do that unless you know you're really gonna be a bird birder. All right, and we got one more question from, is it Illet? Um, do you have pets? Not sure who you addressed this question to. <laughs> Morgan, why don't you take that one, Morgan? Yeah, I have two cats, um, but yeah, we keep them inside. It's really best they can. We I have tons of birds in my backyard, and I do not want to put any of their lives at risk, so we keep them inside. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, I wanted to share some other tips and mistakes I made when getting binoculars. Uh, a more expensive binocular isn't always better. Uh, you might think like oh, the lens are higher quality, so I'll be able to see the birds better. But I've noticed like the better quality the lenses are, the heavier the binocular tends to be. And if your hands can't hold the binocular steady, uh, the image can end up looking really blurry, even if the binocular itself is super good. And uh, secondhand binoculars often work just as well as new ones. So that's another way to save money. Uh, the binocular strap goes around your neck so that can hurt after a while. Uh, something people do is buy a binocular caddy, which kind of turns the binocular into a backpack instead of a necklace. And that kind of redistributes the force on your back. Yeah, Lily. I also want to comment to someone's question from a little while ago. Also, if you want to help birds or support bird populations, something we recommend is put up a bird feeder. Of course, for you guys who are in kindergarten and in school, because it's a really cool way to see birds and get into birds. All you have to do is put out a bird feeder, fill it with seed, and for hummingbird feeders, we want to start hummingbirds, fill it with hummingbird nectar, and it's a really great way to see birds come to the feeders and see their feeding behaviors, and then see 
what they do and how they come and how many species you could attract. And also a good thing to keep in mind is whenever you put up feeders, the good thing to keep in mind is you probably should keep it clean because unfortunately there are many bird diseases out there and if feeders are a way they, they transmit and birds get each other sick. So if you, if you choose to put up bird feeders, which we recommend, make sure you keep them clean by washing them with warm water and soap if you can. So we recommend it and it's a really great way to see and check out birds if you would like. Thank you. Well, um, I, I think I'm, I'm going to draw today's program to a close. Um, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join this NASI Tuesday program. And a special thanks to Morgan, Bella, and Lily for their artistry, their creativity, their knowledge. Um, I very much appreciate being in your company today. Um, before you all leave, we want to let you know that after today's program, you will be sent some resources that we talked about today, along with a list of books all about birds. And as a reminder, join Shirley and me in the middle of May when we're going to have another uh, bird-centric <laughs> NASI program, and we'll be featuring some of these books. Uh, in the meantime, we hope to see you again at our next um, NASI Tuesday program, which will be next Tuesday afternoon, April 4th at 4 p.m. Um, and until then, I don't think the sun is setting for another few hours, so please go outside and enjoy and enjoy the biodiversity that you see right outside your front door. So thank you all very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us. So April 4th is Monday. I meant uh, April, I'm sorry, April 5th. April 5th, yes. I can't even believe it is April, so I'm, I apologize for mixing up the dates. Okay. <laughs>